talk. Hello. We're going to do a talk on what is life or going into the subject of will we ever kill COVID-19. Okay. Well, one of the nice things about science is that it does ask some very deep questions. For example, uh, where did everything all begin? What is everything made of? What are we made of? And what exactly is life? So we see here a whole variety of different creatures that are all considered living, but what do we all share in common? And that will get to the heart of what life is. So we'll come back to that in a moment. Okay. But as well as asking very deep questions, it does ask the kind of questions we might want to ask every day. For example, what food should we eat? What nutrition do we need to get from foods? And also on the subject of health, what kind of exercise should we be doing? What effect does alcohol, smoking and drugs have? How do we keep our brain, our heart, our lungs, our livers and all of our organs healthy? Let's think about our daily lifestyle. What effect does it have on the planet, on wildlife and indeed on the health of us and others? But the main topic that you would be hearing about in the news is, of course, COVID-19. And that then raises several other topics that comes up in science. For example, social distancing. How did they set the distance that we should be? So you've probably heard that we should keep two metres away from each other. So where did they get, get to that? Well, that can be answered quite easily. You can look at the distance a sneeze can travel. You could measure it experimentally or you could do a bit of calculations to work it out. Also, why should we be washing our hands with soap and water? You may have heard that soap and water is more effective than the likes of using alcohol and other sanitizers. The answer is that the soap pulls apart the fatty or lipid layer which goes across the outside of coronaviruses. Also, science would go into is how quickly the disease will spread and the numbers that we might expect. Uh, although it would go into a lot of maths as well. Uh, as you can see here that uh, with protective measures such as social distancing then we'll find that the number of cases would be spread over a longer period of time. So uh, this is what you often hear in the news, flattening the peak, as if we did not do any measures such as social distancing. But the question that we probably all want to ask is how and when can we stop coronavirus? Ultimately, it's going to end when we can come up with a vaccination. But you might be disappointed. This uh, is not going to happen anytime soon. And I'm afraid that if you're going to want to actually kill the coronavirus, then you might literally be waiting forever. So why is that? So we're going to go back into this subject of life again. So as we said before, there's many different types of living things, everything from simple one-cell bacteria to the animals that roam the earth through trees and uh, and fungi and algae. So there's a very wide variety of life. What do we have in common? And again, we said that will be what we consider life to be. So I'm going to paraphrase a famous phrase from a movie. Life is what life does. And that leads on to a lady I'd like to introduce you to. Her name, Mrs. Gren. So you might hear some people say, I can't live without you, but truly, Mrs. Gren is a woman we can't live without. So you might have figured out that Mrs. Gren is probably not a real person. It is, as often is the case in these subjects, an acronym. So what's it stand for? Well, apart from the fact they can't find a chair, it stands for movement, respiration, stimulus, growth, reproduction, excretion, nutrition. So we can consider anything that does all these things or any group of beings that do all these things we can consider to be a living organism and therefore are alive. So let's look at each of these individually. Movement. So there's a whole lot of different movements that we can do. If you can think about how we can move our limbs, our heads, we can turn, we can twist, we can stretch. There's and how do we do it? So in humans and other an animals, it's caused by contraction of muscles, which will then pull the bones in our skeleton. And this is shared with very many other animals too. 
but different living organisms might move in different ways. Well, for a start, many organisms will move in the air through flying, and others would move in the sea through swimming, but essentially, the way they move with muscles and skeleton is quite similar. More simple organisms move in a completely different way. For example, we see the flagellum is a kind of a whip type motion that some single celled organisms do, and others have several smaller ones called cilia. So you might know flagellum better as being what makes sperm move. Also, cilia is what lines the trachea that we have in our windpipe that we have in our respiratory system that kind of stops nasty things from getting into our lungs. So you might think, do plants move? And the answer is yes. So in some plants, it's quite obvious that they're moving. You might have seen the Venus flytrap, the way it closes its so-called mouth. But for things like flowers, you think, would they move? And they do move over a long period of time. The way they move is that they change their direction of growth. Here we see some flowers that are moving towards the window, trying to get closer to the light. We'll see a bit of more of this later. This is a very interesting organism, or rather a group of organisms. It's called the dog vomit slime mold. No, I'm not making it up, that is its actual name. This can sense at a distance where nutrition might be and then move towards it. Moving on to the R of Mrs. Gren, respiration. So a lot of people think of respiration as just breathing, and it's hardly surprising because what we call the respiratory system is the set of organs in our body that we use for breathing. What does that include? So we've got the nose, the mouth, then it goes through the trachea, what we call the windpipe, uh, and then to the lungs. The diaphragm that we see there is just used to kind of expand and contract our body, so, and in doing so, it lets air come in and out of our lungs. But it's not really getting to the heart of what the purpose of respiration is. So what is the whole purpose of respiration? What we want to do is we want to take in some oxygen and take out carbon dioxide. And what's the purpose of this oxygen? Well, our oxygen then gets exchanged into the bloodstream, then it goes around our body. And this is what respiration really is, because if you think about many other living organisms, they don't all have the same system that we have, but they still take in oxygen for a source of energy. So the main form of respiration that we would do uh, follows this equation here, so I hope I don't scare you with the uh, the chemical formulas here, but let's see what it's actually saying. So we start off with glucose. Glucose is just a simple form of sugar. Now you might think to yourself, well, not everything I eat is sugar. True, but then if you eat starchy foods, things like cereals or potatoes or rice and pasta, then in our body this would gradually get broken down into glucose. It then takes in the oxygen that we breathe in, and through a whole series of process, it gets turned into carbon dioxide and water, giving us the energy we need. What the, what's this energy for? So it's energy we use for moving, to warm our bodies, and all the essential functions that go on inside of our bodies. It's not the only way that respiration can happen. If we are using up a lot of energy in a short period of time, we might not have enough oxygen in order to get energy for it, and then it comes into a process we call anaerobic respiration, as opposed to aerobic, where we've got enough oxygen. And in this process, it doesn't produce calm dioxide and water, but rather produces lactic acid. You might feel this when you do some heavy exercise, and you feel your muscles are sore and aching, and you have to put in a lot more effort than you would normally, because you haven't got enough oxygen. Another form of respiration is where we use yeast. Now, if any of you have made bread, then you might be familiar with this. It causes the bread to rise. What is really going on there is it's producing carbon dioxide. But many people are more interested in the other thing that 
yeast can produce if it doesn't have enough oxygen during respiration, and that is ethanol, or more commonly known as alcohol. Although in chemistry, alcohol is a more general name for a group of, of chemicals. And that is how fermentation occurs that is used to make the likes of wines, beers and spirits. Stimulus. What does that mean? It means that we respond to changes that happen around us. So you might think of all our sensory organs, you know, that we can, our eyes, our ears, our nose, our mouth, our skin that we can use to see, hear, smell, taste, feel. But it's not just a, what people refer to as the five senses. There's other senses as well that go in our body. For example, changes in temperature or changes that go on in our stomach. Now, after we receive these changes, it's not just perceiving these changes, it's also acting upon it. So how does that happen? After these signals are received from our body, they get sent through the nervous system to the brain, and then from the brain we can act upon it. Although some things happen without going through the brain as well, a more automatic response, you could say. What does this then lead to? It could then lead to actions of the muscles, causing us to move in a particular way, or alternatively, it could then send signals to different glands in our body, which will produce hormones or chemicals, which again, will cause us to behave or do something in a different way. Perhaps the most famous one would be the adrenal glands, which release adrenaline for that famous fight or flight syndrome that you might have heard of. You might think, do plants respond to stimulus, to changes in the environment? Uh, they do. So here's an example. When there is a source of light in a particular direction, then the plant will start moving towards it. It's in a very clever way that it does that. It has chemicals called auxins that would that get destroyed or damaged by the sun. In that case, it causes it to grow more on the side that is not exposed to the sun, causing it to bend towards the direction of the sun. Even simple one-celled organisms have a way of sensing what's around them. For example, in the picture below, we see that the one-celled organism can sense that there's a source of nutrition, which it will then move towards and then take in the nutrients from it. G is for growth. So if you think in your lifetime, you start off maybe as a small child and then gradually grow to, towards an adult. And this happens, of course, in all living organisms, including plants, animals, and even one-celled organisms. They might stay as one-celled organisms, but uh, they will become larger ones. Well, we have to grow in order to do what comes later on, which is reproduce. So this is maybe the form of reproduction that you're most familiar with. That is where the sperm goes into the egg to create a new organism. It's not the only way that reproduction occurs if you look at all living things, though, although it is common amongst, mo amongst many an animals. If you look at simple one-celled organisms, they can also reproduce, and this time you don't need two partners, in order, you don't need a partner in order to do it. Simply one cell will divide into two, what is called binary fission. Now plants are interesting. They can do one or the other. It's possible in many plants to take a cutting, in which case it doesn't need any other partner. However, another way that plants, especially flowering plants, can reproduce is by making pollen, which will then get put into another flower, forming a seed, which will then become a plant. So there's advantages and disadvantages of the different ways of reproducing. So if we think about reproducing where there's only one parent, the children produced are almost identical, what are called clones. However, when there's two parents, it will take some characteristics from a mother, some characteristics from the father, producing 
unique individuals. The advantage of having one parent is that it's simple, can be done fast, so the population can go quickly. The disadvantage is because the children are almost identical to the parents, you end up with a large population where everything's the same. Farmers often take clones so that they have the same type of crop, but this has a disadvantage that if everything is identical, where well, there is a problem that affects one, it could affect them all. An example of this is a disease that is now spreading amongst the banana population. Most bananas that you eat would be of the Cavendish variety. Unfortunately, if 90% or so of bananas are of this variety, when the disease affects one, it could affect all of them. And they're worried about what will happen to banana stocks in the future now. Excretion. Okay, so we see some solid and liquid excretion here. Within the body, we have the kidneys will filter out uh, what is inside the blood that is not wanted or is even harmful or toxic. It then gets passed out of the body. Nutrition. The food that we eat. It gives for many purposes. First of all, it gives us energy. Do you remember back at respiration? We need it as a source of glucose. It also provides uh, the essential building blocks that make up our body, particularly protein. I do advise you to have a look at some of the nutritional information that you'll find on, on foods. It'll give you an idea of the level of fats, carbohydrates, protein, also uh, the vitamins and minerals. Now I know a lot of this gets bad press, but everything is essential, but what is important is you have a right level of each thing. So how do we actually get nutrition into our body? Well, first of all, we eat it. It then goes into our stomach where it gets digested through acids and chemicals, which we call enzymes. After that, it goes into our intestines and then from intestines into our bloodstream. And then from there, it gets passed around our body. Plants, however, can take in nutrition in a completely different way. Using sunlight, it can take in carbon dioxide, it combines with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and water in the roots to produce glucose in a process called photosynthesis. It then releases oxygen into the atmosphere. So we had a look at Mrs. Grenier's one way up. We consider what life is. Another way of considering what life is, is that which has a cellular nature, whether it's multicellular, like we are made up of many cells, or single cellular. In particular, cells should have certain features, such as a, a, a way to do respiration, such as the mitochondria that we see in the diagram here, uh, some genetic material that will pass on information, such as a nucleus, and also cytoplasm, an area where chemical reactions can occur. Okay. This is so. Do all these creatures have cells? Do they follow all of Mrs. Green? Indeed, they do. So we are all alive. Okay. Let's think about other things. For example, a river. Is a river alive? Well, let's think. It can move. It doesn't really respire. It doesn't really respond to to stimulus. It can grow in a way when two rivers merge. Or you can think if it splits up, you can think of it as maybe reproducing in a way. Uh, perhaps when it deposits things downstream, you can think of it as a form of excretion, or maybe where it takes minerals from rocks, you can think of it as nutrition. But because it doesn't do all these things, you can't really consider it as being living, according to the idea of Mrs. Green, nor does it have a cellular nature. So let's go back on to viruses such as the coronavirus. So does it do all of the features of Mrs. Green? Does it have a cellular nature? So straight away you can maybe see in the diagram that while it does have genetic material, it does not have all the other features we'd expect to be in a cell. And without these features, it can't do many of the parts of Mrs. Green. For example, it can't do by itself res respiration 
or by itself can it even reproduce. So then how does it work? The way that we do these things is by hijacking what one of your own cells. Once it does this, it then causes your cell to produce new versions of the viruses and then go out. So going back to what we said before, now we would never be able, perhaps we'll never be able to kill coronavirus. You shouldn't be disappointed. You should be quite pleased to know that the reason that we'll never kill it is because according to our definition of life, it was never alive in the first place, so it can't be killed. So you might think a lot of the topics that we covered here are maybe just for professors and people who spend all day in the lab stuck in their ivory towers, but it's not the case. You'll find a lot of the subjects that we covered here uh, can be done at a school level at GCSE, uh, including the course that we run at Sutton College. So it'd be great to have you join us for the next term. Thank you.